Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and for the third and final time, or for, for the foreseeable future, I am here with... Drakinavel. And so now we're doing the Q&A for the Battleship uh, video, although there's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of other sort of just general questions here and some sort of just remaining threads and, and strings for us to uh, pick up on, so... Mm -hmm see how we go so um we'll get right into it so our first question here is from benjamin stout uh and his question is is there a kamchatka in star trek and why is it the obarth <laughs> oh yeah yeah the kamchatka the cursed ship that can never do anything right except die um and causes more trouble than it's worth i mean so, to be to be sorry so just context for me, um, what, what, what was the Kamchatka? Right, so the Kamchatka was a repair, sh ostensibly a repair supply ship um, that went out with the Russian mm -hmm. Second Pacific Squadron in the Russo-Japanese War. So, uh -oh. I mean, that, yeah, that whole expedition was not particularly a brilliant idea, but Kamchatka was the worst of all the ships. I mean, materially speaking, she wasn't in a terrible condition the way that some of the other other coastal defense ships they sent um were but she seemed to have a combination of the worst run of luck and or possibly also a malicious crew because she was consistently sending out mistaken signals um and i mean the jury's still out as to whether she was you know just sending out do you see torpedo boat signals just trying to mess with everybody's heads because bear in mind you know we're talking about mid 1900s russia there is a fairly strong possibility that there's a lot of bolshevik sympathizers around um mm -hmm. or you know, was she sending out trying to send out one set of signals and actually hoisting another because this is one of the things with naval signals you you can spell things out but that takes a lot of flags for anything that's complex so the signal code books will have agreed um, flag combinations and those flag combinations mean much longer things so like when I, when I do my live streams there's a pair of flags in the background which are uh, the which are the bat flag for B which is Bravo and Z which is Zulu uh, so it's BZ which doesn't mean anything in and of itself but BZ uh, means well done or maneuver well executed in the code book. So it's a way of hoisting a signal very, very simply and easily. So the do you see torpedo boats? They weren't spelling out every single word in Russian. They were hoisting a, a flag combination. So some people argue that maybe she was trying to signal something else and just got the signal combination wrong. But she did seem to keep returning to this torpedo boat thing a lot. And that's before all the other stuff she did, like getting lost, um, almost sinking in Madagascar through a faulty valve in the engine room uh, and a variety of other things. So, yeah, um, basically she See, existed I, uh, to raise the blood it's... pressure on the Russian admiral. <laughs> yeah, no. So um, I think it's a bit harsh to foist all that on the Oberth because the Oberth just has the misfortune of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yes. It's not that it's incompetent. If anything, I feel like that's how the, the Admiralty uh, get rid of people they don't like, is they put them on Oberths <laughs> yes. and, and send them out. But also yeah. I, thought it'd be, I thought it would be just a good means of talking about um, Oberth variants. Obviously this is kind of leaning more into the 23rd century because we don't see any in TNG, we just see the basic Oberth model, but in in a lot of beta canon there's uh various over derivatives like the i think one's called the uh jester class or the orca class which are like um carry like instead of a science module a torpedo module or a phaser module stuff like that oh no the attack over <laughs> yeah well and i mean you know it's you know pretty pathetic for the 24th century i can't remember what how big they are they're not big they're certainly very small and and pretty pathetic, but they they fit well enough in in their day. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not like the Oberth ever did anything like 
it was never notoriously unreliable. It was just really flimsy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, I'm just wondering: is there an, is there an equivalent to that? Something that was just ridiculously flimsy. Um, to a degree, yes. Um, because I mean, in in terms of you know pure cam chat carrying things around, I I think to be honest, you probably have to look at something like lower decks. I can think of a couple of candidates yes. there. Um, but in terms of just a ship that's so hilariously flimsy, it just keeps getting destroyed. Um, hmm. There are, I would say there's probably a couple of candidates. So if you're looking at World War II, there's a series of Italian cruisers, which are very loosely grouped into a single class called the Condottieri class. Although right. really that is that is possibly the single most torturous abuse of the word ship class ever. Because they, they start off like the smallest one is about three and a, just over three thousand tons and the largest one is more than twice that. Um and the armament varies considerably as a result. Oh so you mean like you mean like a Klingon bird of prey then? Yeah, they're basically the Klingon bird of prey of, of, of the shipping world. Um but the <laughs> Because they start out as ba as effectively the smallest possible cruiser you could build, because the Italians are trying to build a very a very fast just about cruiser to counter the French very large destroyers, and somewhere along the line, I think they lose sight of that and end up building what actually turned out to be at the end a fairly decent set of light cruisers, but the initial mm -hmm. ships and some of the intermediate ships within that series are basically small not particularly well armed from a cruiser perspective but incredibly fast bait destroyer hunters which would have been fine if the italians had actually ended up fighting the french but they yeah. end up fighting the british and when those cru because the british have a lot more cruisers the italians have to put anything that has the word cruiser in its name out there and when they do you end up with, you know, even relative, what for the British are relatively small cruisers like Leander class coming across these even smaller, even less well protected Italian ships and just herring after them because the Italian ships know they have to run because that's the only thing they've got. <laughs> they, they, they can't even stand and fight against a Leander and they definitely can't go sort of duke out blows with it because they, they'll just break. Um, so they they just end up running a lot. See that that also has me thinking of the. Um, I, I'm I'm going to make some people cry saying this. It still reminds me of the Camarag as well. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um. Just so flimsy for its time. There is a another ship from STO called I think it's called the um, Columbia class, and the reason I bring it up is because it's a. It's essentially the NX class, but built with um, the engineering hull. Yeah, well, built with an engineering hull, but with uh, no, no, no. It's it's twenty third century style. Oh, okay. So it's actually um, using Oberth parts. It looks Excelsior ish, but actually looking at it, it's much more. I'll send a picture very quickly. It's much more on on a level with. The Oberth in terms of the kind of mm. the shapes. Um, yeah. Um, the the other yeah. ship which I would put in for being incredibly flimsy um, is I would say towards the, oh yeah towards the end of um, its lifespan in the kind of the sixteen hundred fifteen hundred sixteen hundreds is actually the galley, which right. believe it or not yes it's it's a, a slightly modified descendant of a roman trireme um uh, but it's been around in the mediterranean for the better part of two millennia at that point but by the time you get to something like the battle of lepanto or to be honest even earlier in some of the crusades the galley is showing some rather significant weaknesses in terms of its durability because they they aren't apart from anything their method of construction is quite different so when you think about a ship even an age of sail ship you tend to think of the keel is built then the ribs are built by sort of the skeleton if you like upon which all the planking is installed and it's the mm -hmm. same thing with steel ships you, the hull plating goes on the galleys follow a much older 
style of ship construction which predates that where you build the hull and the ribs and the keel and all the other any other framing is basically there to keep it rigid but is not right, right. The, the main structural element the hull is the main structural part um and so in the crusades you have these rather interesting encounters because you have some really big cogs hulks etc the sort of the northern european ships that have come sailing over towards uh, the the middle east and occasionally you have encounters where a couple of galleys will come out to fight one and there's one i remember in particular where the wind dies so this big european ship can't really maneuver because it's sail powered only the galleys can so the galleys go into ram which is what galleys do and then board and they run into this socking great I mean, as far as you can call them massive um cog and just bounce off and they end up taking more damage to their own hulls from the impact because obviously the european ship is built with a hull a couple of feet thick to withstand the north sea and the atlantic and these things are in- mm. basically built for built for speed which when you're human powered with oars means you build them as light as you possibly, light as you can. possibly can so yes. they're actually doing themselves structural damage just bouncing off of this 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 cog and then later <laughs> on in the battle of lepanto by which point people started sticking guns on things um you have lit- cases literally where a galleys will cut in, in the opening attacks they come flying towards each other because both sides have them but then when they hit um several galleys just come apart from the force of the impact um so the crew are left very rapidly scrambling into a do or die boarding action but you also have cases very much like the Oberth, actually where a single heavy cannon shot um going kind of end to end through the galley manages to disrupt enough of the various elements that are tying the hull together to the frame or they destroy the keel um or a major rib which basically means the ship no longer has any rigidity and when you're flying through the water at 8 to 14 knots and you suddenly have a massive hole punch through you and now no longer any means of maintaining your structural rigidity you have galleys literally just falling apart into component parts mid mid row (laughs) from a single cannon hit which is one of the reasons why there's such a high body count at lepanto yeah Yeah, I mean, I think for, like, the Oberth, that is a good point. Because also the Oberth is is small. It is Mm. very small, particularly sort of the base model without the module. And it's all compacted into just, like... I've seen some theories that the the secondary module underneath is the engineering hull. But if you're saying that... But if all this fan... For all this fan cannon of the... the, underside being modular it mm. can't really hold the reactor it makes much more sense that it's all squashed together on the top and then you just add stuff on the bottom but yeah i mean that does mean that everything is so closely together like there's just no point in having a source of separation for something like that like because just you're so small one shot and you are done yeah and to be fair the um on the actual model itself you have a pair of the kind of spinny disc greeblies which are generally used to indicate here be the warp core on TOS yes. era ships which are, is on the flat section just behind the saucer between the nacelles so mm. um yeah yes. it, it, it kind of the Oberth always strikes me as I, I would hesitate to even call it a proper ship um, mm. or even though it's got an NCC number, it actually reminds me a lot more of the ship, well, the ship stash boats that were created in the Crimean War for what's called what was called the Great Armament, uh, which was basically, right, right. you have the, obviously everyone vaguely knows of the Crimean War, but mm. there was going to be a massive effort by the British to attack various Russian forts and ports in the Baltic, which is you know on the other side of Europe from Crimea, but the idea was yes. this is where everything important to the Russians is. So you attack their forts and their harbors and blow them all up, destroy even more of their trade, and that might force Russia out of the war um, quicker mm-hmm. than you know endless grinds in Sevastopol. 
And for that purpose, they the British turn around and go, oh, this is a good idea, right? We're going to spend the winter building the world's biggest fleet of gunboats um, right. for, for close inshore work and, and siege craft. And then the Russians have the temerity to bow out of the war just as they're being finished. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have you, you the British end up building what you can still see that some examples of actually in East London called the gunboat sheds which they haul them all out, all these freshly built gunboats back out of the water and stick them in a massive series of sheds to kind of stop them from rotting away. And they just keep them there. And <laughs> for the latter part of the 19th century, whenever they need gunboats for sort of about the next 30 years, they just oh, pull out another dozen gunboats out of the store sheds, <laughs> make sure they haven't completely dry rotted. Yeah. And, and off they go into the water. But, yeah, you know, the, the O'Berth, especially if this underside is modular, it almost strikes me uh, maybe at some point the Federation was just like, we need hulls out there and we need them quickly. Maybe maybe in the Klingon, the, the, the sort of the Klingon, pre-TOS Klingon Federation war as it was originally conceived. And they've just, yeah. they've just gone, this is the smallest warp capable craft we can realistically build. Let's build a ton of them. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's hard to tell because the aesthetic is somewhere. It's. It is a. As you can kind of see in the Columbia, mm. it's kind of a halfway house between the Excelsior and the motion picture style. Yeah, a little bit of both DNAs in there. So yeah. I, I wonder, like, if you say, yeah, maybe sort of it was being built in the in the sixties. Because one thing I don't like is is um, we talked previously about TNGification. Yes. Um, and that's been something I've been ranting about ever since. Um, but the you also have this tendency in the fandom to do um, TOSified versions of things. So a TOSified Miranda, a TOSified Oberth. And I'm like, own it's nice. I like them as designs, but they they only really work as it works for the Constitution because the Constitution is actually a substantial ship for its day. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to do all these big refits on such on smaller craft which yeah. makes me think that the the oberth is a more modern class especially because it is seeing use into the 24th century yeah. although at the same time you know i mean the by the time we actually see the enterprise in tos she's already at least at least 10 years old she's already been on a couple of five-year missions mm. and kirk's is the third one so we don't know exactly when this kind of um, motion picture era aesthetic in in naval construction actually hits the Federation. Yes, we, we, the first time we we see it as obviously the the refitted Enterprise in in the motion picture, and then obviously the Reliant has it, but the Reliant ha almost certainly hasn't been refitted. Um, yes, recently so uh, yeah so at some point between the enterprise's launch and when we first see the o birth this aesthetic has come in but it's entirely possible that that aesthetic might be the latest and greatest even before the tos as a series actually starts someone could have invented it in you know captain pike's day um yeah yeah and you know you, you you can come up with any any number of infinite justifications for it, but you perhaps when you look at the TOS and the rising, um, you could even say maybe with the rising tensions with the Klingons plus Kirk's encounter with the Romulans, Starfleet mm. may have panicked and gone ah we need a lot of yes. capable hulls to back up our big ships because how many times is the Enterprise the only ship in the sector? And yes. that, that would kind of explain the aesthetic appearance of the O'Berth, and they're kind of thrown them together, pretty much they're, this, they're space gun boats. And then when it turns out, actually, we're not going to war with the Klingons, and we're not going to war with the Romulans, they've gone, oh, um, um, what do we do with this lot? Uh, stick stuff underneath it and send them out to do all the little the little legwork piece bits, which is pretty much what the gunboats ended up doing in the 19th century. Yes. Yes, I, I think that does map on, especially for, like particularly the Romulan threat, where they they previously thought they could just get away with having those asteroid bases, mm. and then the Romulans are able to blow them up easily, and that's like, ah, we might actually need something that can 
run away and call for help rather than something that sits there and you know has to scramble to get a message out before it's blown up yeah so, and, and also with the romulan ships you don't you know that actually if you can hit them they're not that tough so actually something more lightly armed and maneuverable is a reasonably good counter yeah and and the, the fact that they're still showing up in tng actually tracks as well because as i mentioned with the gunboats of the great armament they were supposed to exist for a couple of years uh, mm -hmm. most they were literally not throw away but they were literally like specifically designed siege vessels and then they end up still still in use sort of even in the 1900s so they have this surprisingly long lifespan which to be fair an awful lot of stuff in military history that gets thrown together at the very last minute tends to last an insanely long amount of time <laughs> i mean the yeah. um the thing about hms hermes um which fought in the Falklands War and the Indians only recently decommissioned and scrapped. She was part of a design lineage of emergency light fleet carriers that were, they were literally supposed to, the hull was supposed to last about three years <laughs> because they were supposed to be thrown together really fast, used in the invasion of Japan and then decommissioned afterwards. They were not supposed to even see 1950. And yet somehow that thing has managed to last longer than most people have actually managed to be alive <laughs> yeah that is that is a curious thing and then you have the old earth just like, rocking up in when the enterprise d is around just like hello we're alive <laughs> still somehow hmm. okay so I, th I think yeah i think we've restored a bit of honor to the to the Oberth there yeah um, it's it's not all that bad uh next question is from twitchy artemis and the question is, are the roaming galaxies a result possibly of jamming? Um, I mean, anything's did, po possible. Because we, we did talk about jamming mm. in electronic warfare. I don't recall if it was in the original video in one of these Q&As. Um, I because... think it was actually in the original thing when we were talking about the galaxies. If I remember because... properly, yeah. I mean, to an extent, yes, in as much as... Uh, I mean, the, the, the real thing to talk about is... Um, well, actually, that, that's the second part of the question, which I feel is the more prescient part. Um, wouldn't, a, for Captain Sisko, wouldn't a less jammable ship than the Defiant be a better choice for leading that battle? Yeah, you see, this is the... I mean, there's there's two elements to it. With the galaxies themselves, yes, in theory, it could be because of jamming, but then at the same time, of all the Federation ships, you'd expect to have the electronic warfare capability to reject the jamming. The galaxy would be it. The galaxy. I mean, also, I mean e even, before a, even before a wartime refit, it's designed to be a science vessel. It's designed to have these... Or an exploration vessel. Therefore, it's going to have this massive sensor array and a lot of electronic cap capabilities which should be able mm. to filter through jamming. And that, as I say, that's yeah. before you put in any kind of wartime activity stuff. Yeah, well, and also, and I'm not a big expert on sensors, electronic mm. warfare, radar, all that sort of thing, but I would suspect that they do know what direction they're meant to go in. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean... Is jamming. Um, you know where you were, and you kind of know where you are right now, so you know where you should be going, and it's not back the way you came. Yeah, and I mean, it's like, to be honest, like, you, okay, some of it is for cinematic effect, but given what we see in Sacrifice of Angels, you could literally just look out the window. Yes. Like, even if every sensor was down, it's like, well, you can almost, al almost spacewalk from ship to ship in that environment. It's not exactly difficult to figure out where where you should be where, yeah where the lines are also funnily enough you mentioned looking out the window and i'm mm. thinking in um peak performance where Riker gets the drop on the enterprise by using a fake romulan warbird mm. makes them panic and then the reason they realize it's fake is because someone looked out you, poked their head up to a window and had a look yeah said hang on a minute it's not there um which does kind of just amuse me that the moment the ship is under attack, some poor bugger has got to run up to the windows 
just in case. Yeah, just in case there's some kind of fancy electronic warfare is going on. Um, I mean, the the only the only thing I mean, and with the second part of the question, I mean, yes, in theory, um, being on a ship that's less susceptible to jamming would be a good thing. On the other hand, we don't know exactly where the defiance sits in the rank of ranks of electronic warfare resistant craft in the federation although one would suspect that since it was it is unlike with almost everything else in the federation specifically designed for warfare uh and you know to fight the borg and so forth you'd think it would probably be a little bit more hardened against such things than the average starship so um, i'm just thinking because the Borg don't really use electronic warfare, because also it may well interfere, I'm just thinking for the Borg, mm. that might interfere with the operation of the collective consciousness. Yeah. Um, so that might actually be why they don't use it. Mm. So what it may well be that the Defiant, I'm just thinking of the battle in First Contact, mm. where it's dodging uh, tractor beams. Yes. And potentially that's because it's using electronic warfare to just throw their targeting sensors off. A little bit, yeah. so it can use electronic. So it may well have been built to use electronic warfare on other targets, but not actually have any capacity for resistance itself. Again, I don't know electronic. Yeah, it's warfare possible. Goes, I mean, but... it's it's not it's not the kind of thing that go, that Star Trek tends to go into a lot of detail about. So, you know, we we don't know exactly what the hierarchy of Federation ships is in terms of electronic warfare resistance. My, my if I was going to try and put together a serious explanation as opposed to just the captains were a bit kill hungry um for the wandering galaxies um the only other explanation i could potentially come up with would be that possibly the galaxies were nominated as roving troubleshooters yeah um, local so fire, fire fort. Yeah, because because when when the Defiant does break through the lines, Cisco, the first thing Cisco says is, "Did any other ships make it?" Because they're thinking about they then they don't know that DS 9s defenses are going to be offline, so they're no, thinking yeah. about having to break through with a force sufficient to take on DS Nine, and they know exactly how tough a prospect that is. So it may well be the maybe the galaxies individually are capable of just sort of bull rushing their way straight through the dominion lines but then they're getting there and they're going ah well great or they're getting close to it and then they're going but no one else has survived the run kind of how the sea tech yes. and the majestic blew up um and as good as a galaxy is they know one galaxy alone isn't gonna cut it against ds9 so then perhaps they're turning back and going, well, if I can cut a swathe back through the Dominion lines and open up a bigger gap, then maybe more ships will be able to follow me through on a second run. And then I'll be able and then we can all go together, which is kind of what Cisco was trying to pull off. Yeah, I, I could definitely I could definitely see that because, yeah, the galaxy is it's good. It's powerful. It's not meant to fight a space station. No, and even even if it's got a hypothetical, really powerful war refit, um, which they do seem to have, it, it, again, it would make sense because it would be basically almost the only class of ship that would be capable of sort of stopping midway through the Dominion lines and going. Actually, I'm going over here now. Uh, <laughs> try and stop me. Yes, because I mean, it, really, what you need for what you need for attacking something like DS Nine is mm. standoff ships like the like the Norway or the yeah. Freedom, if there are any, or the uh, Akira stuff that can stand mm. off a little bit, try and stay out of range of DS 9s yeah. powerful weapons. The the other thing that, that does make make me wonder is that obviously a lot of the time when we see the galaxies they are in proximity to the defiant and cisco has specifically said that he's trying to get through um and if you remember at one point uh i can't remember whether it was a squadron of hideki's or jemhadar fighters one of the two but they actually they come in from another part of the dominion line and drop in on the on the defiant's tail and mm -hmm. they're the things that get blasted off of off of them by the incoming klingons 
Yes, yeah. 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 And I'm just wondering, given that the Defiant is a small, fast-moving threat, and we don't see as much of that happening as you'd otherwise expect, given that the Defiant is the flagship, I wonder if m maybe another explanation for the Wandering Galaxies is that Cisco has said he wants to punch through... And that these other galaxies, they've gone off in various directions in the vicinity. And w the reason we see them wandering past is maybe they have chased down squadrons of fighters and Hideki's and maybe the odd galore or two. And um, and things, all these other Dominion and Cardassian ships that are trying to fold in on Cisco's offensive. And the galaxies have been, you know, knocking them down. Yeah, yeah on the way Definitely. through which is why when cisco's doing his fly through there's actually he's basically just facing off against the ships that are in the line there yeah, yeah. That, that that would that would help i mean the, the real problem you kind of come to is and this is kind of part of the question mm. why did a why is cisco a captain just a captain in command of a grand fleet action which comprises well 600 ships on his side about his side and about 1200 on their on the dominion hmm. side why is he in command like okay i i kind of get him hatching the plan i'm i'm sure you do get that but surely you want someone like higher higher up and further back who's able to actually look at the thing look at what's going on to be actually making the the decisions of how to run the battle. Yeah, it. I mean, obviously the the out the out of universe explanation is Cisco's the main character, the, the captain of the series, so he has to be front and center. Um, you couldn't you couldn't promote him to Commodore. That that's the. Uh, yeah, because then he then he'd turn evil, wouldn't he? Yes, that always happens. Um, I, I I mean, if you if you look if you want a logical explanation, then well, <laughs> you you've got you've got two possible explanations, I guess. One of which would be the which actually has disturbing implications for the size of Starfleet, which is that a fleet of six hundred ships is still considered small enough to be under the command of a captain uh, because rem remember compared to the original plan they had to rush and he says we're taking elements of the 6th, 7th and ninth fleets mm. so perhaps the Admiral's ships for those fleets hadn't arrived yet and so they've thrown together this scratch force and maybe he genuinely was the the ranking officer um, if Admiral Ross was staying back on the star base um, so that could be one thing, and um, the other, another one, another explanation could just be that something you actually see occasionally happen in the Age of Sail, especially, which is that as people accumulate exp combat experience, um, mm. they may not be eligible f um, for promotion just yet, or they haven't got round to promoting them just yet, but it's recognized that in time in a time of war this particular individual is actually very good at this specific task so they get allocated that even if their rank their official rank doesn't necessarily otherwise say that they should be in that that role yeah um, i mean I, I you can kind of make you can make more of an argument from that for mm. the original series era where communication is very spread out and haphazard and you know People, it may well be a long time before you actually meet with your uh, seat with your commanding officers on a starbase or whatever. Less so in 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 the twenty fourth century, though. I mean, I'm just wondering about Cisco's relative levels of combat experience. I don't know if there's any beta cannon that sort of fills that in because he has no. three five well, nine. Yeah, I'm thinking more more in terms of specifically experience with the Dominion and. Gold Ducat specifically, so he's kind of because it, 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 mm -hmm. if you if you if you were you theoretically could maybe bring in a, a more senior captain or a commodore or um or even a full fledged admiral, but if if their entire experience for the last ten years has been you know leading ships on the other side of Federation space. Or they're a, like mm. a Romulan specialist or something, whereas Cisco's been, you know, 
clashing with Dominion forces and has a fairly intricate understanding of Goldacat's thought process, he's probably actually got more relevant experience for this particular fight. That that, that is, is true. true. That, that is, is true. true. And also, that, that does kind of that's, that's almost, almost the benefit, benefit of knowing your enemy because you mm. know that Goldacat is commanding. Yes. It's far easier to to work out what Gold the Cat is going to do than some random Vorter who you've never met before. Yeah, and and it may also be, if you really want to sort of go down the rabbit hole on this one, it may also be that perhaps the Federation, because Gold the Cat is not exactly an unknown quantity at this point, the Federation, Federation Intelligence, may have concluded that Ducat has an unhealthy obsession with Cisco and the Bajorans, especially because obviously Cisco mm. is also the emissary. And even if they don't necessarily believe in it themselves, they may have concluded that if they put Cisco in command of the fleet that's coming at Ducat at DS9, then Ducat will obsess over Cisco at the expense of the what broader tactical situation. Yes. yes. I mean, one, one of the, the things, things that kind of happens in that battle is, so as you say, the Klingons come flying in on the flank. And it, it's it's not, I don't think we ever get a sort of real sense of the numbers of Klingon ships. But given that this is a fleet action of 1,200 against 600, that we do know that, those numbers are spelled out. Yeah. Um, it's probably, I think, I think I ended up concluding it would be around about 300 Klingon ships. Um yeah, I know they have the cloaking device, but mm -hmm. you shouldn't be getting snuck up on by a force of 300 Klingon ships out of the blue. <laughs> I mean, they they really went in for, like, full-on World War II references as well, because they also have them, if you remember the initial sequence, they actually have them coming out of the sun. Yes. Which works perfectly well in World War II fighter engagements and shouldn't make the blindest bit of difference um, no. to, to, I mean, to this. You, Yes. yes, I mean that is interesting because it sort of implies that they were fighting in a in a star system, mm. but even even though it's it looks like deep space from every other angle. But, yeah, I mean yeah. that's that makes perfect sense because star systems are big, and there would be the kind of space you need to fight a battle like that. Um, yeah, I suppose the only the only thing you could argue would be that if the Klingons are coming in under cloak, given that we know that the federation signals were being jammed if we assume for the sake of reasonableness that the the federation was doing its level best to um to jam the dominion and cardassian sensors even if they weren't necessarily winning the the total um war the, the jamming war with um the dominion the dominion had the upper hand there then but maybe the they they were knocking back the Dominion sensors enough that they didn't re that the they didn't pick up on the disturbances that would have obviously say probably would have given away something was happening. Yes, I mean I think I think to also an extent there was perhaps almost a Waterloo situation where because it's not really portrayed in in the nineteen seventy movie, but in the actual battle you have um, you have a whole basically second, second flank, flank of the French, French army that's, army that's off, off over there, there fighting, fighting, fighting the, the, the vanguard, vanguard of the Prussian, Prussian army that they, they know, know is coming. coming. And then I think they, they even they spend a lot of time screaming, screaming say, they're, they're coming, coming. We, need more, we, we need more, we need more, we need more troops. troops. And, and they just, they just and, and it's sort of just, it's at the back of Napoleon's mind. He isn't keeping much attention to it. And I can imagine a similar thing was happening with Ducat. Someone was saying, oh, yeah, the, the Klingons are advancing. Yeah, whatever. I'm, I've nearly got Cisco where I want him. Yeah. Which would, again, kind of vindicate if it was Starfleet Intelligence's decision to put Cisco at the front to distract him. Hmm. But maybe you do have someone else further back who is actually, in the case that the cat gets lucky and actually does catch him and kill him, that you have someone else ready to step in. Yes. Because it is almost like, okay, this is the plan. Good luck, everyone. Off we go. Like, he's in no position to, like, offer any kind of, uh, you know, contingency if something goes wrong. 
No, it's um, yeah, it's very, uh, especially especially once the communications go down, because once once yeah, that yeah. happens, it doesn't. To be honest, at that point, it doesn't matter if you've got fifteen backup commanders. If no one can talk to each other, um, you just have to go with whatever the orders were last and hope for the best. Yes, yes I, mean, I mean, equally, equally communications, communications being, down being down may well, may have, well have been because they, they were just, just so far. far Cisco was punching, punching so far into, into the Dominion, Dominion lines. lines. You know, and just outrunning his own support in that respect. This is true, yeah. Uh, which does kind of bring up the third and final point that Twitchy Artemis makes, which is, I don't... Cisco was not in a great place when designing the Defiant. Do you think, you know, he was envisaging, and, he's, and they're thinking particularly of the um, Defiant's ejectable deflector module, do you think Cisco was planning to one day pull a Moby Dick? Um, entirely possible. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily know if he was specifically planning on, you know, Leroy Jenkinsing the Defiant straight into the net first ball QB came across when they eventually returned, um, but it may well have made him a lot more amenable to the idea. Um, of a ship that has this kind of last ditch, last ditch emergency measure, which effectively is kind of a sticking two fingers up at your opponent. <laughs> so yes. You, yes. Uh, yeah. In a lot of ways, it could literally be yeah you know, that that kind of Moby Dick from Hell's Heart, I stab at the kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but but when when you've got an an officer like Cisco who has at that point when he's on on the project, he has lost everything as far as he's aware to the to the mm. borg um he's going to be a lot more amenable to designing a ship with that kind of feature in mind which is probably yeah. again probably somebody back in the higher echelons of of starfleet being very cold and calculating and going well this is what we need but if we take a, a jean-luc picard type off of the line another very re sort of highly respected officer it's typical more typically starfleet and say right design us an anti borg ship they might come up with something vaguely like the defiant but it'll have all these crew amenities and it'll have the <laughs> escape pods and the, the 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 last action of the ship will be to preserve the crew whereas if we give it to someone like cisco the last action of the ship will be blow blow a socking great hole in the side of the cube which, considering the cube is coming to assimilate a planet, is probably the lesser of two evils, but not something that typical Federation culture, circa TNG, would actually ever think of, unless you're basically going through post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. yes. I mean, it, I mean it, it, does, does, it, does it does kind of... Interestingly, in when I did my Battle of Wolf 359 video, and one of the ships in Excelsior class does try to ram the cube, because in, in Best of Both Worlds, it's mentioned that the Borg have, like, rather than a shield, they have an electromagnetic field or a magnetic field. So what I envisaged happening was that this Excelsior tries to ram the cube, and then it just, the magnetic field basically activates and mm. repels the ship. So with equal, with equal or greater force to uh, which the ship is flying at the cube. Yes. So that the... the, the Excelsior just pancakes itself against the magnetic field. So Which, again, possibly yeah. having having like a defiant ejectable thing, almost like a tandem warhead, have that go out ahead of you, blow up, the, blow a hole in that magnetic field, so that you actually can hit the cube. Possibly. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, uh, I I think having someone like cisco on on the defiant project was probably a bit of an inspired work of genius because uh you know it's a it, it, he's someone who is willing to make the sacrifices and he's willing to twist the knife on the enemy if necessary mm. um yeah, it, yeah. It, it, I, I know i've said it a fair bit on my channel but some of your viewers might not be quite so aware um it, it kind of has a certain amount of precedent in history because you had in 1940 when everyone was expecting the next thing to happen would be the Nazis come, turning up over the channel. You had the Admiralty and the Army making all these defence plans for the southern coast of England. Mm -hmm. But the unexpected for most people third party that was involved in a lot of this correspondence was the Home Guard. 
And mm-hmm. a lot of people think of the Home Guard as, oh, yeah, you know, Dad's Army types, you know, slightly eccentric, mm-hmm. etc. But when you read the correspondence, which I obviously have done, what comes through a lot is that, yes, these might be the Home Guard, but you stop and think about it. So you're talking about 1940. So these people yeah. are in their 40s and 50s, which basically means they're the veterans of World War One. Yeah, They're yes. the people who fought when they were 18, 19, 20 in the trenches and are now just too old to sign back up again for the main army. Mm. So they've been through all of that. And now they're being told those same people you spent possibly up to four years fighting in absolute hell in France are mm. now coming for your family and your children. And they suddenly get horrifically inventive. Um, yes. Where, uh, to the point that, um, that one example I, 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 do, I have mentioned a fair bit on the channel. For the, de- for the defences of Dover and the beaches surrounding it, the army admiralty proposals involve, okay, we'll demolish the harbour when the Germans approach there, so they'll try and land on the beaches. So what we'll do is we'll have all these pipes... Um, with oil in them and Mm -hmm. we'll pump all the oil onto the beaches and into the surrounding sea and then we'll set the oil on fire and then the invasion force will see that everything's on fire so they won't land so they'll go away um and job done and then uh, the letter from the local home guard um commander shows up which is basically like yeah that's a genius idea except how about we let the germans all land first then we set them on fire um (laughs) and you're just like wow that that's that's harsh (laughs) Um, that's harsh but yeah yeah, would work yeah Uh, yeah. uh, and i think it's the same analogy i suspect you would probably find a good chunk of the wall 359 survivors such as they were were probably also on the defiant project yes Yes, all similar things. things Yeah. I mean, the other the other kind of example of that is in, or at least how I portray the Battle of Tyra, where basically the Seventh Fleet is this new raised fleet, um, where they use a lot of old like, uh, sort of semi auxiliary slash mothball ships. They bring those out and they bring people. Either they get out cadets from the mm-hmm. academy, rush them out, get them on board it, or they get you know recently retired officers. To serve as you know the experienced commanders, they think, well, these guys have got a wealth of of experience and and um, you know wisdom. And yes, they had experience of the Cardassian border wars and stuff like that. Not facing the the Dominion head on. So yes, yeah, sometimes it works and sometimes it it really doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, it's um because of course the other kind of I'm just thinking the other kind of World War One style wisdom. I mean that is that was in, you know very well thought out. Um, although I don't know how difficult that would have been to set up, it might have been quite difficult. Uh, but you have like the other end of that is Tog Two. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Is... Although. <laughs> The, the TOG 2 is one of those slightly weird things in that it's it's designed entirely for the previous war. Um, mm. But then, bizarrely, at the time that it is designed, when you compare it to every other tank that the British have, it's not actually that awful. <laughs> it's got thicker front armour than almost anything else in the production at the time, and it's carrying a heck of a bigger gun than anything else in production at the time. Um... And when you think about you know when its prototype is being built, the probably the most lethal threat it's going to face off against is fifty millimeter on Panzer threes and short barrel Panzer fours. Mm. A long barrel seventy five millimeter tank with respectable front plate would actually probably not be too bad. The fact that it's like six miles long and designed for crossing trenches and has a mobi- the mobility of a sloth on Valium. <laughs> those are some of rather more significant design flaws but <laughs> yeah I, I do think i'm just thinking about it i'm sure you know in bovington where it's kept mm. they put it right next to the, the the little cafe section next to the children's play area and all the uh cold war well some of the cold war heavy tanks and uh some of the more modern stuff so i think chieftain yeah. conqueror and the challengers are up there 
And so I feel like that's a bit of a harsh placement. I feel like a more reasonable thing would be plonk it alongside, um, plonk it next to uh, you have uh, the A1 E1 independent, Char B the Char B1 beast, and then you have the Tog two. Because then, yeah. from that respect, it doesn't look nearly as horrendous. Yeah. It's kind of it's got the core of a few good ideas in it, just wrapped up in a lot of a lot of stuff that was that is you know pre pre war thinking. Yes, yeah. So it's, it's although again you, not... you see you see it up against things like Conqueror and Chieftain, and you realise how big the blasted thing is. And <laughs> I suppose it's also uh, an example of you make something big enough, and it's going to be lethal no matter what. Yes, I mean there is that. I mean the yeah, it is. It does stack up very well against what are some pretty big vehicles especially conqueror that's that's insanely huge mm. um <laughs> now we're just doing a tangent about up, up tanks yeah 